That was inspiring, and it had that feeling of a lot of work as well. You know, this is this weird moment we're in. As you said, it's a, a mixture of getting engaged, making sure people get engaged, but also if you track the science, this is really hard. Yeah. So uh, that makes this a very special kind of thing we haven't experienced before. Yeah. Kate, uh, you, well, you met Kate earlier. I assume everyone here has been here since the morning. Kate is a great climate scientist at NASA and Columbia University, and she's become a really powerful writer and voice in the, in the, the, the noise, the, the noisosphere, <laughs> trying to cut through the noise. Um, I wanted to start with um, one brief reflection on my journey. I did bring an artifact. I've shown this here before in National Geographic. So 31 years ago was my first cover story on global warming, 6,000 words of most everything you've seen in the news lately. Uh, wildfires weren't in here yet, and it was mostly Antarctic, not Arctic, which is interesting. But it was so long ago that I wrote the same words uh, that we still had cigarette ads on, on. So we're selling global warming on the front and cigarettes on the back. <laughs> and I hadn't really absorbed that at the time. I was the senior editor at this magazine in 1988. And it had the same messaging you've seen ever since. You know, there, they, it ends with the kicker, the kicker in the story. If you have time as a journalist, it's the ending. And you try to be artful at the ending of your story. And it was this uh, inspiring talk by Mike McElroy at Harvard. We had a kicker, a kicker. We had like a visual kicker, too. Um, he says, Mike McElroy is a Harvard climate scientist who I think he's still at Harvard. Uh, if we choose to take on the challenge, we can slow the rate of change. Uh, or we could, I'm kind of paraphrasing, we could alternatively close our eyes, hope for the best, and pay the cost when the bill comes due. So that was 31 years ago. Um, and I wrote a bunch of stories like that from then to like 2006. Um, and 2006 was the first time I interviewed a behavioral scientist, a sociologist uh, at UC Irvine. And she laid out some of these things that that body of science had profoundly established as much as a greenhouse gas functions in the physical sciences that, you know, we have these biases, single action bias. It, it, you know the list. Many of you are in the behavioral realm. And that was the scariest science to me at all. I'd been on the sea ice at the North Pole. I'd been in the burning Amazon writing a book about the murder. And, and the thing that scared me most was the behavioral science. It's the, the climate in here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've seen possibilities, too, that are emerging through that same science. So I wanted to start by asking you both, um, what aspect of your experience, Kate, so far as a communicator, that part of you, and even, including communicating with other scientists, freaks you out the most? And, and what part excites you the most? Like uh, some examples would be good. Um, the thing that freaks me out the most is related to what you said. Um, so I know what happens to a column of air when you heat it up. I know what happens to water vapor when you heat it up. Um, and I'm a physicist, so I work with these models that say this is what's going to happen to the physical climate system. Um, I have no idea what people do when you heat them up. Um, <laughs> you mean emotionally heat them up? or? I, I, I do not yeah. know how people respond to a warming planet. Um, I know that if you look at history, people generally tend not to respond to adversity by calmly considering the best available science <laughs> and then making informed choices. Um, and, and that is the thing that freaks me out the most, um, is climate change happens on the planet that we make for it. It's not happening in a computer model. It's not happening in a, on a toy planet that we can do experiments on. It's happening on this planet. And what we're going to do to each other, how climate change is going to change our societies, the way we relate to each other, our political discourse, that's something that I feel like, as a physicist, I have no training in. But it's also, I think, the most important part of climate change. And on the upside, I, I wonder if you think um you, you became a public scientist. Not every scientist I know, most don't desire that. They're not rewarded for it. And they're punished for it in that, the, in the public true. sphere. <laughs> so uh, is there some, some spark out there? Did you connect, have you connected with a person on this planet that you wouldn't have connected with otherwise if you hadn't been in this public sphere? And, and that's led to something encouraging. It could be in science too, yeah. not just in. No, that's a good question. Um, my dad identifies as a conservative, um, and 
It's been really interesting to see how he has responded to climate change because I think culturally he does not identify as an environmentalist. He doesn't identify as somebody who would find it okay to care about the environment. Um, and, and kind of watching his journey, watching him kind of change his mind, accept that this is a problem. And um, I would love to say that I changed his mind. Um, reinsurance companies changed his mind. Um, the fact that this sort of profit motivated, you know, really sort of hard nosed industry takes this seriously when they have no incentive to do so other than it being a serious real problem. That was the thing that, that changed his mind. So just kind of watching his journey, you know, and understanding that facts matter, science matters, but science isn't the only thing that matters. Stories and the way people think of themselves and groups and trusted messengers, those things matter too. What Kate just said, or it reminds me of one reason I'm attracted to the Project Drawdown model, which is um, it's not relying on the spark that you described was about a personal, local engagement. Um, and the whole idea of Drawdown is there's a there's a hundred, if not a thousand, ways to make progress on this. I recently wrote a piece in National Geographic, actually last year, on getting comfortable with that given how we grew up with this issue back in that in the 80s, mm -hmm. we just wanted a treaty or a law and then that would solve the problem. Something from the top down would solve the problem. And we could kind of just do our thing. Um, how do you feel about Drawdown right now in terms of next steps? So I'll tie into your first question to Kate and I very much agree with kind of what uh, keeps me awake at night. Um, and my journey into this work actually came out of trying to understand humans. And I studied literature and religion um, and the sort of social science side um, of, of this world. Um, and what, what I feel sort of distressed about and what I hope Drawdown is helping to move us beyond um, is that I so much still of climate communication is treating this like an awareness issue and I think that it's not an awareness issue anymore. I think the issue is actually helping people go from awareness to some kind of ownership right. of response, um, whether that's in their personal lives, their professional lives, in the public square, through telling different stories and changing paradigms. Um, but still, we're screaming facts at people. <laughs> right. um, and, and I think, actually, not only that, the very experience of awareness has freezing components to it, right? It's too big, it's too much, I'm terrified, I'm sad, I'm ashamed. Um, and what I hope is that through, through Drawdown's work and through other fantastic work on the, on the solution side that we are helping to create those solutionaries. Um, that when you begin to see what the footholds of action are, your imagination gets going, right? You know how often the question is like, well, what can, an, what can an individual do? And I hate that question because there's no checklist. And I think we should all get comfortable asking the question, what should I do? What can I do given the context I'm in, the talents I have, the resources at hand? Um, so I, I hope that in, we're kind of entering into what we're calling Drawdown 2.0, um, that it will be about taking this work and sharing it much more widely um, and helping to put forward this narrative of courage and determination that's grounded in um, the solutions at hand. And how much of this, one, one thing that I transitioned to in my own life was from the storytelling journalist point of view of mostly being in that direction. You know, I, I grew up like the older people here with Walter Cronkite saying that's the way it is every night. So we didn't have to actually do anything ourselves. We, just, <laughs> we didn't have to examine information. It just was that's the state of the world. And National Geographic, you know, all those magazine covers out there in the hallway are an amazing uh, example of the, that classical style of journalism, and it still matters hugely. But one thing I think is a gap and an opportunity for journalism, and we're, we're getting into this here in a big way, and for science, and for organizational efforts, is to be a portal and a hub, a place to an exchange for information, um, not so much a source of information or of skill sets. Yeah. Um, and that's why I love it when scientists get on Twitter, despite the noise and the hassles and the, the men. 
Yeah, mostly the men. Mostly, mostly the, the it's men. true. Very it's, angry It's men. science. It's mostly <laughs> angry men. Uh, uh, but you're connecting. You're, you're creating kind of a zone of uh, credibility, a zone of, um, hey, I, you know, I live in the Hudson Valley, which I do. I live in a house in a neighborhood that only has oil heat as an option for keeping our houses warm, unless you want to spend a huge amount of electricity. What can I do? Uh, Mark Jacobson at uh, Stanford uh, has articulated these rapid decarbonization paths, but it, one thing I've criticized him for in terms of their output is creating a template where communities can say, well, how do I do that here mm -hmm. uh, you know, in my town? Is that a big part of how you would expand what you're doing? We, ho we hope so. Um, the truth of Drawdown is we're a full-time team of six people, so it seems like our work is really big, but actually we're very small. Um, and But what, what we've seen is this kind of wonderful upswelling of like grabbing Drawdown and putting it to work in, in different ways. So there are all these self-organized Drawdown efforts and communities, and we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, given that we can't do everything, what are some of the ways that we can uniquely sort of provision those efforts um, and, and give folks tools and resources that can help them um, do the work, but also tell, tell the story. Um, right. And I very much agree with, with Catherine Hayhoe's message in her recent TED Talk that the role we need everyone to play is talking about it, right? We need to be telling different stories from a place of not angry screaming on Twitter, but from a place of empathy um, and a place of, of connecting the dots on our values um, and, and our lives. So one thing, I was on the radio yesterday on, on point, um, an hour long program where we brought in the voices of a lot of the kids who were marching mm -hmm. on Friday. And uh, you know, as the Graybeard, uh, the 30-year guy who had been interviewing kids who were at climate talks doing the same thing in the, the year 2000 and 2005. I, I was holding back, and I didn't want to be the the scold. That's an internet word, uh, you know, the the chide, <laughs> the the VSP, as my friend David Roberts called me the once, a very serious person. Very serious. <laughs> a VSP is not some, a tag you want. You know? No, no one wants and, to go to that. No. Party. So and so this get Kate, you know. When you think forward, um, how, how, do you find a way to enable the next generation that doesn't have that aspect to it, but it's true to the science? Yeah, I mean, I think very few people have accused me of being a very serious person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, so the reason I love my job um, is that you cannot know everything, right? So. I study the Earth, and there's a lot of stuff going on on the Earth. So I very, very quickly run into a place where I don't know what I'm talking about, so I have to go get an oceanographer. I have to go get a soil scientist. I have to go get somebody who studies this particular type of cloud. And that really sort of breeds empathy, and it really makes you very comfortable with saying, I don't know, mm -hmm. what do you think? Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you're talking about climate action, that's a really powerful thing. So you don't position yourself as I am the expert, listen to me. Because if I try to do that, you know, first nobody would listen to me. And I think nobody should listen to me. I don't think we should have this model where we have experts up on pedestals who get to dictate things. And so I think when it comes to things like the school strikes for climate, we need to be listening as much as we're talking. And I think the interdisciplinarity, is that a word? The, the fact that climate science bridges multiple disciplines makes us more suited to be able to listen. It doesn't mean that all climate scientists are good listeners. I want to stress that. Mm -hmm. um, but we should be better listeners, and I think we're getting better at that. And I think this gets at um, a, another really important point of sort of inviting people into the space. I think sometimes it can feel like you have to have eight PhDs to even begin to engage in the conversation. And that's intimidating, and it's alienating. And I think there are a lot more people who are sort of just on the sidelines wanting to participate in some way, but feel like, yeah. I don't know enough, I don't understand the physics, I, you know, whatever. And I feel similarly, I mean, 100 solutions in Drawdown, there's no way for me to even begin to keep up with the literature, sure. right? And so also being comfortable saying, you know, here's what I do know, here's what I don't know. Um, and, and inviting more collaboration, more conversation, um, which I think is something, frankly, that younger women in this space are doing really well. And uh, we're, we're toward the end, we're at the end here. But the one <laughs> thing, a lot of what we've been talking about is 
and we almost assume it because it's so prevalent now, is the, uh, the way we communicate. The way you would find a, a, a soil scientist now is not through someone you met at Harvard or wherever, it, it, through your own personal lineage, it's uh, this thing called the internet. Yeah. And um, we have at every scale, from the town mm -hmm. to the school to the White House to the science enterprise, an unparalleled capacity to make that system work and not just be a source of noise and, and um, turmoil and discord. It, it all starts with conversation uh, as a path forward. So thanks for... Uh, your time, it's gonna be a great day of conversation and action. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy.